Bill Preston's heart to hear and to see what was going on with this baby. So outside the realm of family, outside the realm of making a living, outside the realm of your friends, my question still stands, what burdens you? What breaks your heart? Rather than asking the question of what can I do this year? What is my New Year's resolution to maybe lose weight, eat healthier? All those are good intentions. But maybe ask not what you can do for yourself, but what can I do for those around me? You also may be thinking this. Sometimes we have this expression, well, I can't change the world. You're exactly right. You may not be able to change the world. This is your next. You may not be able to change the world, but I can guarantee you, you can change someone's world. You can change someone's world. So asking this question of what breaks my heart, what is so important that pertained prior to this question, we see in verses 2. Nehemiah says that Hananiah, one of my brother, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Hmm. You ever heard the old adage, what you don't know can't hurt you? What you don't know can't hurt you. So if you know the information, then you're required for the obligation. If you don't know the information, then you're not required for the obligation. It's kind of the same thing I found in 1987. There was an AIDS public campaign slogan that said this, don't die of ignorance. And that same application still applies to us today. It applied to Nehemiah. Nehemiah wanted to know. That is your next thing. He cared enough to ask. He cared enough to ask, hey, what's going on with my people? What's, what's, what's taking place in Jerusalem? So the question is, for you all, do you care enough to ask what breaks your heart? Do you care enough to ask what burdens you? Read you guys a, a bio from Robert Pierce in 1947. He became a full-time evangelist for Youth for Christ. An appointment which shortly took him to Asia to evangelize America's servicemen. The poverty, human suffering, and the plight of orphan children haunted Pierce. And he vowed to mobilize conservative Christians back in the United States to meet these needs. In 1950, Pierce founded what we know today as the World Vision International. At first, to primarily meet the needs primarily of children orphaned by the Korean War, pushing a line of argument that Christians must first deal with with people's basic physical needs to have a better opening to preach the gospel. There's also another guy here locally by the name of Patrick Withrow. In 1911, started Union Mission Ministries here in Charleston, West Virginia on Clendenin Street. And he basically had the same slogan. That slogan was this, soup, soap, salvation. And Pierce goes on and says, Pierce took on a grueling regimen of travel and aggressively pursued both church-based and corporate help in feeding, clothing, and educating World Vision's young wards. In the process, Pierce utilized radio and television broadcasts, films, and mass advertising, and in 1960, created World Vision's famed South Korean Children's Choir to publicize the organization's efforts. Of the mid-1960s, World Vision was caring for over 65,000 children in 20 countries. Today, Richard Stearns is the president of World Vision. He wrote a book that is phenomenal that I would recommend anybody to read. It's called The Hole in the Gospel. Today, there is over 45,000 staff on World Vision. They serve over, in, uh, over 100 countries. And they serve over several million people a year. And because of Robert Pierce... My family has had the joy and the honor to sponsor our child eight years ago by the name of Edgar, who lives in Honduras. We've got to see him grow physically, mentally, spiritually, but none of that would have been able to happen for Robert Pierce. My point is this. Just like Nehemiah, 
Pierce dared to ask the question of what broke his heart. What breaks your heart? The fact is, on your outline, the fact is, when we care about people as God cares, it, it, won't, it won't matter how painful that, that situation that you're going into, it, it won't matter. All that matters is if you honestly care as God cares for his people. The facts are, it, nothing will matter. You will want to ask. You will want to ask. You will want to know. This breaks my heart. And so, Nehemiah knowing this, he goes, and again, he, it's like a, a prayer journey. From verses 5 to 11, he, he, he gives us this prayer that he's communing with God, and he breaks down his prayer into three different sections. Starting in verse 5, he says, And I said, I pray, Lord, God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night for the children of Israel and your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now, these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hands. Oh, Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants and the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Notice nine times prayer prayed or prayer was used in this verses 5 through 11. That the, the word that, that he is trying to get across is, is talking about interceding. That he is, he is communing with God. He is interceding for the behalf of the people and the, for the behalf of himself. Now what's interesting is, maybe this is just me, but I look at this passage and I say this is quite comical. Do you know why? Because Nehemiah is a mere human being. And in verses 6 and seven and eight, specifically eight, remember I pray the word that you commanded your servant. Basically a mere mortal, a human being, is telling Jehovah, is telling God of the universe, the very God who gives him the breath of life. Hey, God, I just want to remind you um, about your covenant with, 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 with your people, with us. So I just, I want to remind you that, that you have this covenant with your people. Really? I find that very comical that Nehemiah is going to remind God. But on the flip side, what I also find very interesting is that he has this communion. He has this sense, this relationship with God like no other. That brings me to my third point. First of all, you ask what breaks your heart Second, do you care enough to ask? And then third, well, how do I know what breaks my heart? How do I know what, what, what breaks my heart, what burdens me? The best place to do, the best place to find out that information is we've got to spend this time with God. And notice that Nehemiah, he was claiming God's promises. He was claiming God's promises. He was claiming God's covenant. Well, how would he be able to do this? Because Nehemiah spent time with God. Notice throughout the entire verses, he's talking about 
um, bend your ear and your eye will see on this and, and let me see your ear. It, it's to the point where this is such a personal relationship with God because he has spent time with God. I know a guy that I get up with every other month. He's kind of like my mentor. He's another pastor in Huntington and we meet in Tays Valley, Hurricane Area, whatever else. And this last time I was meeting with him, he gets up every morning at 3.30 in the morning, except on Saturdays at 5.30. I don't even know there's two or three thirties in a day. But he gets up at 3.30 for the sole purpose, not, not to brag, like, I just asked him. He didn't give me this information. I was just asking him some things. But he gets up for the sole purpose because he loves that time. Being with the Lord before his household awakens, before the, when, when the grandkids are over, when his kids are coming in, before his wife gets up, before he has to go into the office at church. At 3.30, he gets his, his cup of coffee, he goes into a particular room, and he just spends that time with the Lord. Getting to know him, getting to know his word. He spends time in prayer and fasting and all these things. I say this. It's because how do you know what breaks your heart? First and foremost, you've got to get alone with God. You've got to get alone with God. In verses 5, we see this with Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven. Stop there. Four times in Nehemiah, that is a divine title. What Nehemiah is saying is, Lord, I recognize that you are the triune God. You are the God above all these other little gods and deities that surround me in this culture in Persia that these people think they're actually dissatisfying. But I know who you are. I know your promises. I've spent time studying your Torah. I know your word. I know what you've done for me. I know what you've done for our people. I know that you're faithful. And because of that, Nehemiah praises God. 